I know there's a little bit of a delay, but when you do log on, let me know that you can see me and let me know that you can hear me. And I'm just gonna go check to make sure I'm showing up in all of the places. A couple of people have logged on, I can see. Okay, it looks like I'm good in YouTube, um, Facebook. Awesome, people on Facebook are happy. I don't know if I'm showing up on YouTube or not. Oh yeah, I am, I am showing up on YouTube. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm everywhere I need to be. Hi, it's Monday of the shortest and rainiest, wettest day of the year. Um, so it feels like it's been 5.30 for like three hours already. I kept checking my clock, thinking I had missed it, that I had just forgotten what day it is and what time it is because it's looked like it's 5.30 all day. Um, but that's going to start changing, so that's exciting. Um, also, I posted about it this morning in the trading group about the workshop that I'll be running in January on loopy agility training. Um, it snuck up on me because in my head it's like in January and it's, you know, it's just December. Um, but, you know, registration opens in December for it. So tomorrow morning, registration for Loopy Agility Training Workshop will open. I think it's around, it's 9 a.m. Um, workshops in general don't you are not usually like classes where you have to be registering on the dot. Um, but historically, my workshops that I've run have sold out within the first few hours. Um, so if you are interested in a working spot, I would pay attention to the registration time. Um, that being said, all participants, even auditors, get to ask questions about the workshop. Uh, the working spot just allows you to submit one video for me to review. So that's the difference between auditing and working in a workshop. Um, so that opens tomorrow morning. And um, it's, if you saw my Lemonade Conference presentation, the information is going to be loosely the same, but because I have to pack in more into the workshop, of course, I'm going to redo the slides. Um, so some slides might be the same. There's going to be some new slides. And I'm re-recording the whole thing, obviously. So what I say is going to be completely different. I, I know 100% for a fact the way I say it might be completely different. So even if you have it um, from the Lemonade Conference, you might be interested in going ahead and grabbing it as well. Um, also, if you are on the FDSA uh, newsletter, you probably got an email that says um, that workshop week is coming up soon. I think it starts on Wednesday. Um, but FDSA students voted on which past workshops that they would like to be brought back for purchase. And the one of mine that got selected for workshop week is agility jumping skills. And that is a, it is jam packed with jumping skills that I do for my own dogs. And it's a little bit of a twist. It's not a fitness jumping skills. It's not grid work. It's mostly the jumping skills I teach based on my handling system. Um, so we, it's just at a, it's got a different angle on it than most of the jumping related things that I've seen available out there. Okay. Um, so really just focusing on the jumping efforts that are needed and how we can support those jumping efforts. We talk about 
um, commitment and keeping commitment. So um, I'm getting really good feedback. Thank you guys. I'm glad you enjoyed jumping skills. So if if you didn't get that when it ran, I think in June, I think it will be available for purchase starting on Wednesday. So um, you can get yourself a Christmas gift um, and, and grab that up. And I'll make sure that I put that link when it's available um, in the group, okay? Um, I know that the, the biggest feedback I got from that workshop is that I need to turn that into a class. And so it just got added to my list, but I'm really glad it's gonna be available for sale again. Um, it is suited for young dogs, absolutely. The, the, each skill is broken down kind of in the way that I would introduce it to um, even a puppy as young as Torch's age, so 17 weeks, because there's a lot of flat work that I do. Um, and it kind of just touches on the things that I do for commitment, for keeping commitment, how I um, convince the dog that they should keep the bar up, even though my my handling is distracting them. So it's just kind of, there's a lot in there. Um, so, and mm, I don't, I, I would assume you'll also get the feedback lecture um, so you'll actually get to go in and see what I assume, what the what the working spots did and their feedback for them. So you're going to get um, the whole thing. Okay, I assume. Don't quote me on that. But I, I it's in everyone else's library. So I would assume. Anyways. OK, so that's that's that. That's what I got for sale this week. <laughs> So I'll stop talking about that and we'll start talking about what you guys came here for. Um, so let me know if this is your first Monday musings because you wanted to hear what I had to say about teaching agility. So let me know that and welcome if you are new. I hope you enjoy it and continue to come back every Monday. Um, someone confirms for me that yes, you get both. Excellent. That's perfect. So there's a ton of feedback um, in that feedback lecture because I don't know, 10 or 12 or 15 working spots submitted homework. Okay. So you get a lot. You get to listen to a lot of me. Okay. We're going to talk about teaching group classes. So if you have questions as I go, feel free to ask them, but do try to keep them on track for teaching agility and group classes, okay? Because I think just for brevity's sake, like if we also dive into um, private classes and online stuff and, and all that sort of thing, I don't think I'll be able to stop talking. Um, if someone has it handy or could grab it, the link to the most recent podcast I recorded um, with Sarah Streming of Cog Dog Radio, Sarah and I really dove into just kind of all the pros and cons of all the different ways you can train. So I think that's a really relevant um, podcast. If if no one grabs it now, I'll make all I thought to grab it um, this morning and then I forgot. Um, but that that just kind of touches on from both the student and the teacher's perspective of the pros and cons of everything. Um, so that's kind of where this has this has been on the back of my mind. Um, this whole teaching thing. Uh, so so we're just going to focus on group classes. So if you do have a question, just tell me. Even if you don't teach agility, so. Tell me if your question is from the instructor perspective or the student's perspective, just so I can um, continue to understand what you guys really want to know about. Okay. So the first thing I want to cover is in a group class. One of the things that came that kept coming up in that question thread. So um, if you're brand new to the group tonight because you heard about this talk. In the group are two question threads. Um, I asked what agility instructors wanted to know, and I also asked what students want to know about this kind of process, how 
instructors kind of decide all of these things. Um, so if you're new to that group, go ahead and find those threads after this is over and add more questions there because the more questions I get gives me a better sense of what to talk about um, because I'm, I'm really passionate about this stuff. Uh, so what to teach? The, the big over kind of the umbrella question was how do you take everything that you know that you teach to your own dogs and smash it into a curriculum that people want, that people want to buy, that people want to keep coming back. And the short answer is you need to balance your expertise with the clients that you have. And this was really difficult for me at first um, because I wanted to, I wanted my students to all want the same things I want. And that's completely unrealistic, okay? I have the way I do agility and then my clients each have the way that they do agility and the time that they wanna commit to doing agility and the resources they have to commit to doing agility. So it really is a, it's a difficult balance. I'm not gonna pretend it's easy, but the, the moment that it does start to get a little bit easier is that when you let go of trying to uh, make your clients kind of carbon copies of you and your goals, okay? However, as my mentor and friend, Dr. Catherine McAleese would say, behaviors are caught, not taught. So you should be, you know, presenting yourself in a way that you want your clients to present back to you. So being a good sport, um, how you compete, your students will watch that and they will, tr they will try really, really hard to replicate how you compete. So if you, if you make a mistake and you're disappointed out there, that's kind of telling your students that it's okay to be disappointed and like let it be seen. Or if you come out of the ring super happy all the time, no matter how it went, that's what you're modeling for your students. So there's, there's a difference here in trying to get your students to replicate your just your etiquette and your behavior. And then there's getting your students to replicate your training practices and your goals. So kind of that's step one is let go of that. Step two is <clears throat> learn about your clients. What <laughs> the students are singing hallelujah right now, okay? And this is really, really difficult. Um, and I'm just going to say that I, I built up a very, very big business of in-person classes and group classes with multiple instructors and, you know, over 200 students and ended up going my separate ways from a facility because of a difference of opinion on philosophy. So just know that, that you're allowed to do that. But also I was in a position that I could leave because I didn't want to do it someone else's way. Um, I wanted to, to still put my clients first, but promote excellent training the way I wanted training to be done. Okay. So if you are teaching agility at a facility that's not your own, you might be limited in how much you can do anyways. You might have to cater um, to, you know, whoever you're working for as well. So there, it's a tricky balance. Um, I always ask myself, and when I'm working with instructors, kind of helping them uh, build their curriculum, I ask them, what is your job? And this can be, well, my job is to get the, this group of students from point A to point B. And then this group of students from point B to point C. I'm just reading the comment. Great motto, caught not taught. 
I try hard to do this, but can really learn more about not expecting people to be into agility like I am and me. Exactly. And this is exactly what this whole talk is going to be about, essentially, is how to get your students on a track and then keep them there and keep them progressing. OK, so ask yourself what your job is and maybe even ask your students if you've had a group of students for a long time, um, send out a survey. It's not going to get a huge, I mean, it depends. Um, typically, surveys don't get a huge response, but even if you get a little bit um, or just some personal feedback, it just depends on the, the group that you have. Um, if they're comfortable giving you direct feedback with their name signed on it or if it needs to be an anonymous survey. But if you send out a survey, it kind of gives you, and I did these pretty regularly for a couple of years. And like I said, it was not a high percentage rate of what came back to me, but the feedback that I received was consistent. So it was easy for me to go, okay, this is what the majority does want. Um, and they're willing to tell me what they want. So they're probably going to get it. Okay. So asking, you know, what is it that you want from me? What do you want my job to be? And then also writing down for yourself, what do I want my job to be? You know, do you have a full time job and you're just teaching on top of that one or two nights a week is teaching agility your full time job. You're teaching 15, 20 or more classes a week. I'm thinking how many was I teaching at the peak of everything? Um, and is your job to give the student valuable information? in their class and a way to move forward? Or is it your job to make get their goals for them, right? Like, so sometimes I think as agility instructors, we take on too much, actually. We take on too much responsibility for the student's progress. It can also happen that we don't take on enough, as in setting the students up for success. That's my job. That's what I feel my job is, is to provide an environment in which my human learner can indeed learn, but then the rest is up to the client. So I'm gonna make it as easy as possible for the students to keep moving forward towards their own goals, but I'm only gonna go that far. I'm just gonna make it possible, right? I'm gonna, and it took me a long time to get there because I would stay up and lose sleep over how am I going to make this goal happen for that person? And we can't, okay? So that might be the next step is taking a little less responsibility because also the more responsibility you feel you have over it, I'm going to guess that you are, you, the instructor, are going to be more frustrated if it doesn't happen but it may be that your student is thrilled with what's happening, okay? So I just said, put a little bit more responsibility on the client. So how do we keep the clients motivated? Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to just brush on communication with students because I think next week I'm going to talk for an hour about communicating client to instructor, instructor to client. Um, I'm going to grab this question. I wish more students knew how much sleep instructors lose. Um, yeah, but I don't think we should be. I'm saying stop losing sleep over your clients. Right. It has to be you cannot put more into it than they are, honestly. So I do think they I th I think students, for the most part. Know that you put energy into the lesson. But 
beyond that, if you're putting energy into something that you can't control, that's about you. And I, I owned it that staying up and losing sleep wasn't helping anyone because while I'm sleeping, my student is sleeping. Me losing sleep doesn't help that trainer, that student be better. So once I kind of let go of that, I actually did get better and so did my clients. Um, I'm going to grab this question. When I was first starting agility, it would have been really helpful to know specifically what my teacher's goal was. Um, what did she see her role as? What was my responsibility? I think this is really important. We're going to dive into it a lot more next week because this lack of communication um, and expectations is probably the number one problem. Okay, so when you are motivating clients, be clear. Clarity, I, um, I said this to a friend today, clarity is the way to win my heart. If you are clear with me and you give provide good instructions for me that are easy to follow so that I can be successful, I will love you. Okay. And I, I, I weigh pretty heavily my success on that one thing, that I am clear. Okay? So just like we work really hard to be clear when we are training dogs and we are clear with our own dogs and when we take a client's dog from them, we are clear with their dog. We need to be just as clear with the human. That is the nut, I promise. Like if you are not getting, I mean, I'm that way at the dentist. My favorite, my, my current um, hygienist, she is the most clear person on the planet and she is consistent. I have consistent cues of when to open my mouth when to keep my mouth open, when to close my mouth, <laughs> like when to turn my head towards her, when to turn my head away from her. She is the most clear uh, dental professional that I have ever been to. And I love her. And if she stops working for my dentist, I will cry. Okay. So clarity is the way to my heart. So the clarity that you use when training dogs needs to be extended to the humans. I guarantee you, if you are not getting what you want from the human, it's probably a clarity issue. Figure out another way to say it, figure out another way to explain it, figure out another way to show it to them, and they will get it. Okay, just like you wouldn't repeat sit, 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 and getting no response from the dog right? You wouldn't do that for very long before you would change something to be more clear, okay? So clarity is the number one thing. It will motivate your clients because in the same way, I mean, come on, right? I can say this, right? We all react, respond really well to good, clean training. We respond to positive reinforcement. It's really no different than working with our dogs, when the learner has clear instructions so that the path to reinforcement is clear, they will be motivated to learn more. Okay. Tell them why. Why are you having them do this? And why are you having them do it this way? Okay. This is also a balancing act because when they're brand new, it's very easy to overwhelm them with the why. And sometimes when your student knows a lot, and I mean when they know a lot, it can also be difficult because they're like, but why? Yeah, but why? Right? So you have to meet those clients fold in the cheese. Oh my gosh, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And if you don't get this reference, it's a Schitt's Creek reference. 
and someone should also drop that link in the group because that's exactly it. Fold in the cheese. I don't know. It says fold in the cheese. Well, obviously you just fold it in. It's just, it's fantastic um, between David and his mom making this, I don't even remember what the dinner dish was, but that's the only, th those were the only instructions and neither of them have ever cooked anything for real. So it's hilarious. Clarity will fix everything. And that's the end of my TED talk. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> okay, so explain to them why. Like I said, I went through a phase, and, and I, I got to a point where I did not, I was no longer teaching the brand new, they're making enchiladas. So obviously, um, I was no longer teaching the brand new to agility students because I overwhelmed them way too quickly. I, I have a very difficult time under explaining or only giving just enough. I've gotten a lot better at it. Um, I've gotten a lot better at it because of online training, um, trying to keep things as concisely as I can change this one thing. And here's why I want you to change this one thing. Um, but so as a student, I think my middle name is why. And some some students are going to be questioners. They physically can't do the thing unless they know why. I live with this person. And it's very difficult because I will just do it. Um, I was working virtually with um, a personal trainer today and we were going over um, a new to me workout and she would tell me, you know, change this one thing, fix this one thing, you know, uh, tilt your head up a little bit. I never once asked why. Okay, I believe you. And then there are those students <laughs> And I would change the thing and it would work. And she would tell me it was, it looked good and it was very good. And, uh, and, and I was fine with it. And then there are the people who tell me why they physically cannot connect the synapses in their brains without that bridge. And so that could be what's missing for some of your students. And I, if you're, <laughs> This is important. So like I said, we're going to talk about it next week. Thank you for grabbing the YouTube link to Fold in the Cheese. Thank you for grabbing the podcast link. Um, it's it's no problem for me that you have to know why. But like I said, we're going to talk about communication next week. But if you are this person, let your instructor know, I really need to know why we're doing this. Can you please tell me why? We'll also have a live on how to be a really good student. So hold those thoughts. But um, I'm gonna grab this because you can't retain it without the why. When you are given the why, students, I want you to relay it back to the instructor, okay? So if the instructor comes over and says, I want you to use your dog side foot, to cue that jump because that is the accelerator that's going to be a more natural cue for your dog to go. When you use the outside leg, it's actually telling your dog to stop. And then just before you do your do it again, relay it back. Okay, I'm gonna use my dog side leg because that is a more natural cue for my dog to go forward. Relay it back to them because that will help you retain it. Um, da, 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 da. okay. Another way about this is what are they going to gain from doing it your way? It's another way to say why, but that it's, it's maybe a different way to go about it as to not overwhelm because sometimes why becomes this, you know, four page dissertation, especially if you're me. But you can just you can just say it in a way that you're going to gain more obstacle focus if you do it this way. So tell them what they're going to gain from making that change. 
from doing it differently than the way they're doing it now. You can also, okay, so what are they going to gain? What are they going to get if they do it this way? Positive reinforcement. What happens if they don't do it? Tell them the consequences of continuing to do it that way. It doesn't have to be in a nasty way, but just like I said my example before, the if you're using the opposite leg to send, the non-dog side leg to send, send you're potential you're you're letting your dog extend on a slowdown cue. So the what you get, what happens if you don't change? Honestly, most of the time it means that your dog's your dog's slowdown cues are going to um, deteriorate and you're going to have a harder time cueing collection. So if you tell them the flip side, then they get to choose. Okay, so instead of like you said, some, um, someone saying that they over explain, if you just stick to that, what are they going to gain if they change? And what are they what's going to happen if they don't? Now they know which what two consequences are on the table, cookie or no cookie, and they can decide. Or maybe they're just two different varieties of cookie, chocolate chip and um, oatmeal raisin. That's really not a choice, is it? Um, <laughs> right? But if you tell them, they get to choose. A really good example of this is um, I like one arm serpentines. It's not natural. And this is like go, going into a tangent, but let, okay, so let's keep it to, if I want to train something that's not natural, like a one arm serpentine, it may make layering more difficult. So that's what I tell my students. Yes, you can teach the dogs to converge on you automatically. Yes, you can do that. But you may, it may make layering more difficult later on down the road. So they get to choose. Um, and of course that means they have to know enough about their bigger picture to help. But then if they don't, that's your opening to insert more of the why and then help them come to a decision. Okay, any questions so far? Puppy is making the sweetest sleepy noises, little whimpers. Okay. Retaining students. Like we said at the very beginning, their goals might be different than yours. So as long as you are moving them towards some goal, they can see measurable progress they'll keep coming back, okay? So small outcomes, and we're gonna talk about how to make that work best we can in just a moment. But these small little benchmarks of, look, you accomplish this and you get to move on to the next step, and you accomplish this and you get to move on to the next step, and and so on and so on. And giving them, um, things to look for. You can do the heavy lifting of this a little bit in the beginning. Pinpoint very specific things that you see are improving. Okay. Wow. I really like how you are picking them up from the end of the rep and transporting back to the beginning. He is so glued to your cookie magnet. If you pick out the very specific things that you are seeing improvements on, they will start to see it themselves. And so then it's it gets easier and easier and easier to keep them coming back. 
Uh, this is a it's a good it's a good point. So the comment is the student might be taking lessons from multiple instructors and the various instructors might disagree on the why. And this is potentially confusing to the student. Absolutely. This does come back a little bit to what is your job and how and how much um, it bothers you. OK, and. So I, I did get to the point where I, I did have a few and I would observe week to week the doing and undoing of one particular or two particular skills that I knew were a difference in handling philosophy. And so I, I asked, I know enough about the general of all of most of the handling systems that I can uh, troubleshoot and problem solve and things like that. But I, most of that comes from the massive amount of knowledge I have about how dogs naturally react to things. So then I can make assumptions as well, or educated guesses is a better word. But I, I do, I would eventually go, okay, look, there's a little bit of conflicting information here. Um, you know, I, it's just a difference of philosophy. I would just flat out ask. This is how I see it happening. And this is why I would do it. I can't speak for that other instructor, but this is what I see happening. If you go this route, can we come to some decision or compromise? And then it's on the student then to go to the other instructor and say, this is what I've decided. But if you have a student that's flip-flopping, depending on whose class they're in, I would um, step in and try to narrow it down for both their sake. Otherwise, it doesn't bother me. Students going elsewhere. Um, okay. So, and then also we have to make sure that the, the students are enjoying just the overall um, environment that they're learning in. Okay. Very rarely did it happen, but I would on occasion have groups of clients that they did not mesh. It just was not going to work. And I had to rearrange some classes, either because I could see it plain as day or students were comfortable enough to come to me and they were like, mm -mm, not taking class with that person. So sometimes that happens. But if one of your learners finds the environment toxic for any reason, the learning is not going to happen. Okay. So just like our dogs, we set them up to feel comfortable and safe in the environment that they're learning in. That is also true for our human learners. So if you're sensing some of that, um, I would try <laughs> giving some opportunities. You can approach it I'm giving away all the secrets, but you can approach it very subtly. Like just give everyone an opportunity. Just email that whole class. Hi, I have some opportunity, some openings if you're interested in trying out another day or time. Because the person that wants to be moved will be like, yes, please. And they will move. Okay. Um, but otherwise, if you know the client really well, you can just flat out say, hey, do you would you feel better coming to this class? It is hard when you can't move one student. It's really, really difficult when you're stuck either because all of your classes are full or the student can only come to one day at a time. Then I try just really hard to keep that class busy. Like they're not allowed to socialize. I keep them busy. Like I'll, maybe that class gets like different assignments. Like you go help that person and you go help that person. And hey, can you come over here? Like I just, they're not allowed to like mingle. <laughs> so, and there's only so much you can do because they are all adults. And if they can't get along for an hour or 90 minutes or whatever, then, you know, we could, you're not you're not um, babysitting them, but it it's a it's a real thing. Um, I'm gonna grab this question. What do you do if you have trouble 
meshing with a particular student. I set them free. I live and teach in a small town and I'm in, I am it. Oh, you're it. So I find it hard to say no, even if I don't mesh well. Okay. So is it something that you can train them to be better? And we'll, like I said, next week, we're going to have a chat about communication between client and instructor. And then pro maybe the following week will be about how to be a good student, which will also require how to train them to be good students. Um, so that that's kind of where I would go at first. If I can't set them free um, or release them to other opportunities is a nicer way to say it, I suppose. Um, then I would try really hard to train them to be uh, the client that you do want um, because they may feel the same way. They're like, mm, I really want to do this, but there's just something missing, right? There's just something mm, I'm going to keep trying. So they might also be feeling um, that way as well. Okay. So before we, okay, so the last thing like group classes is this building a curriculum that you can keep your students in, even if you have a wide variety of levels. Okay. I think this is um, the hardest part. Okay, because you'll you'll start like a group of puppies and they're they're all blank slates. But two of the students, you know, missed a couple of weeks and two of the students are really experienced trainers and they train every day outside of class. And then the other two, they're doing really well. They're trying. But, you know, they 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 work full time and, you know, they might practice once or not at all outside. Like, great. You get those clients <laughs> there, those classes that have this wide range of experience level. So then you want to keep going with this group of dogs, but you, they're at six different places in the, um, in, in your curriculum. So my, the best way to do that is to build um, curriculums that are like pyramids. So you have like, let's say your first, um, your, your first set of classes gives you your bottom row of skills, right? So that might be like um, all your, all your like baby puppy stuff, like whatever's on your list. My list would be like my essential skills. So like your reinforcement strategies, focus and engagement and toy play and leash skills and stationing. So like my first set of classes is the, the skills that I need them to know to be able to, to move on. But like, I don't need stationing to start cone offering or wing offering. So I can build things on top of each other, even if they don't have the complete bottom row. So even if one of the dogs is not, didn't get everything that they needed in that first set of classes, they can still keep progressing over here while we continue building the bottom row over here and then they can start. But each time I, I set to do a an exercise like the teeter, for instance, um, if you took my teeter program, it started with backing up onto a mat. So but then it goes to backing up onto a wobble board and things like that. So if we're going to work on the teeter because it's a pyramid thing like that, it doesn't matter where the dogs are on that pyramid. They can all do a teeter exercise and, and they just do which piece that they need, okay? That will get you a really long ways without having to create six different curriculums for one class. So try to set up your skills in a pyramid scheme and then interlock those pyramids. So um, doing those bottom row skills are gonna gain you access to, like let's say there's five bottom row skills. Well, if you have any one of those, there's maybe four potential skills you can do now. And then, right, so it just keeps getting more and more complex, the pyramid scheme, but if those, if those different skill pyramids that you have 
also overlap or interlock or somehow share skills, they'll get trained. Those dogs will get trained, even if they're not practicing outside of class, even if they miss a class. Um, they'll still feel like they're in the curriculum and doing the same things, but then you're also meeting each team where they're at and, and everyone feels like they're progressing. And then you can keep students together um, a little bit longer, especially when they're in that awkward um, phases of foundation-y kind of sort of kind of sort of maybe start some sequencing, but not really coursework type things. Um, so it, it takes a little bit of work at first to kind of figure that out, but then it, it does run really, really smoothly that way. Um, okay, so this comment says, I pulled the student to the side to talk with him, also talk about other things, but they have not seen it for themselves yet. Yeah, so honesty and transparency is going to take you a long way with all of these issues. Okay, question time. Those were my general thoughts on teaching group classes. Um, you know, how many you have and how long your class is really truly depends on um, your overhead expenses and um, how much you can charge and your, you know, the area of the country you're in or the area of the world you're in also plays a role in how much kind of culturally you can charge. Um, I honestly think agility classes don't cost enough, um, but that's a different conversation for a different day. Um, probably maybe a private conversation, <laughs> but, um, I ended up doing five dogs in 90 minutes because anything, any more than that, I wasn't satisfied with the amount that I want to talk and knowing that I need to give the teams adequate training time with me watching. So that's the number I landed on and that paid the bills. If I really had my way, I'd probably do three students in 90 minutes. because I like to talk. Okay, do you guys have any questions? Okay, if you do think of a question, just post it um, as a new thread in the group. I'll see it much more easily than I will if you add it here because Facebook messes with the order of the comments on live videos, um, so they're difficult to find. But if you come up with another question about like the dynamics of teaching group classes, or something a bit more specific. I know this was pretty general, but hopefully helpful. Um, just pop it into the group and I will answer it, but I'll grab this one. How do you set boundaries in classes when the, stu oof. <laughs> when the students are also your friends? Um, this is tricky. This, um, and it's much more difficult to do after the fact, but you set them and you stick to them. What tends to happen is we set those boundaries and then we break them because they're our friend. 
But then of course it gets messy because then sometimes the friends come to expect that um, certain amount of bending from you. And then other students see it and they also wonder why that they're not getting the rules bent for them. So the, the real answer is the, the responsibility to hold yourself to that criteria is on you. I used to think that it was the responsibility of the client slash friend to stop poking at my boundary, but it's my responsibility to stop letting it be poked at. Set the boundary, be firm. Oh, like, um, hey, can you save me a spot in that seminar when everyone else is paying a deposit? That's a big one. Or prorating classes. I'm really, I'm going to miss the first two. Can you, like when it's not in your um, policy to prorate classes, can you, so favors like that. Can you save me spots? Um, can I sign up early? Can you prorate for me? Um, things like that. Um, it can also leak into uh, your time at trials, right? So if your friends are hanging out and wanting your advice on how to, or want they want to talk about how to run the course, is that a boundary you want? Like, is it something that you want to do? Do you want to talk about the course and give, you know, your mental energy to talking about the course with your friends slash students at trial? So anything really, if you're feeling like, you do stuff for your friends that you don't do for your other clients, that is potentially a boundary you need. Can you talk about time hogs, people who always manage to squeeze more times on their turns than other students. Sometimes it has to do with them taking a long time to set up for their turn or the dog making mistakes that take time to fix. Um, is this question, um, oh, you, is this, okay. Is this an instructor or a student asking? Um, because one, I'm gonna give away all my secrets. I time everything. So once, and this is also about helps when you have a nice group, because when I, when I was teaching the group classes, some groups were super chatty, like somehow I would get lucky and um, okay, perfect. This is an instructor question, but I'm sure some students are thinking it. Um, so some, some groups are, they ask questions. They're my, they're my questioners. They're the ones that ask why. And this is usually when, when students don't get along is because you've got four questioners. They love talking about agility. They don't care if they get their dogs out that day, they want to talk about it. And then there's one that just wants to train their friggin' dog, right? And so those, those two things are very difficult and it gets um, awkward fast when you have four questioners and one doer in the class. Um, but if everyone is a, like, so that's usually how it happened is um, some, some of my groups, they would talk, they would want to discuss things they would want to really dive into the, the whys and train less. And some groups would be opposite. So after we would explain the exercise and go through everything, yada, 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 I divide whatever time is left evenly amongst the students. And then sometimes I would give them the option and say, um, so it, if it was more of a talky class, so remember transitions, like one student leaving the floor and the other student coming out, it's two minutes. Like, so time management wise, this is a good question. Um, each transition, even if they're good, two minutes, like getting the one dog leashed up and off the course and getting another dog leashed up, off leash and getting ready to go. It's a two minute transition. So one thing, that I did was I said to my students, your time starts when you take your dog off leash. 
So that meant that they would not rush their dogs. They would really truly ask their dog if they were ready to work. And also they would be on it. They would get, they would get going. Um, so I would sometimes give the, the students the option of one long turn because then there's not the transition. So they would get more time or two shorter turns. But accounting for those two minutes per dog, I've got five dogs, two turns has 20 minutes, right? 20 minutes of the class is spent just on trading out teams roughly, okay? So it matters. Time management is so important. Um, how much time they got depends on how, how much working time they got depended on how much we spent discussing it, explaining it, um, getting ready for it, things like that. That was more like the handling classes. The foundation classes, I tried to keep my explanations five minutes or less so that we would have 15 full minutes to work on that exercise. So about three minutes per dog. Um, and in the foundation classes, there would be no transition. I would just watch this dog train for three minutes and then I would rotate and watch this dog train for three minutes and rotate, boom, 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 so I could get more in. It's a, it has to be well oiled if you wanna get a lot done. Um, so, but what to do with, so using the timer. Um, some student, cause you, you have those students that, that want to get more out of it, but you also have those students that are way too aware of the clock and they can't function because they have the pressure of their time clicking away. So I, I tried really hard to have a mental note of this one has pressure. I would turn the sound off on my timer. I'd flip my phone to vibrate. So if their time did go up and I wasn't finished with them, they were not getting panicked about their time. But if I have those, you know, more... Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna use your the time hogs. Either they, they want a little bit more or they don't realize that volume goes all the way up. And I let it ring for a little bit. Sometimes it's just really far in my pocket and I can't get it. And I can't, oh man, why can't I get this thing to turn off, right? Because it is kind of training them. Like this is how long this takes. Okay, so I do try to meet the personality of those clients with that. Um, and I'm really, just be honest. That was your timer. We can pick this up on your next turn or we can think about starting again here next week or this is where you could pick up at home. Um, and then I, I try really hard to make sure that that the lessons aren't too difficult because if the student is running out of time every single turn without having accomplished what they were hoping to accomplish then the lesson was too difficult what you were asking for was too difficult it was always my goal that we finished the objective of that turn before the timer went up. So then it was, then we could feel some freedom to discuss things more or experiment with something more or just give the dog a little bit more um, reward time, right? So it's a really, um, it's, a, it's a hard balance. I'm not saying anything that I talked about today was is easy. Um, but hopefully it helps to hear what I've already figured out so that you don't have to also claw your way through the trial and errors to figure these things out. Was that a sufficient answer? <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so any more questions, just pop them into the group. Um, if I don't answer them, via text, I'll grab them next week, um, where we're gonna talk about 
communication between instructor and student and student and instructor and how to make some of these uncomfortable things a little bit more comfortable. Okay, so I will see you guys next week for our final chat of 2020. Isn't that crazy? This year is almost over, you guys. All right, I'll see you guys then.